And lastly, we arrive at the Strecker synthesis. I've had frequent visits from William Stryker. Stryker. His name is Stryker. His name is Colonel William Stryker. Stryker! Here's how the Strecker synthesis works. If we begin with an aldehyde, treat it with trace acid and ammonia, I generate this intermediate, an imine. Probably looks familiar. I can now treat this imine with cyanide, and the cyanide nucleophile goes into the carbon, kicks the electrons up onto the nitrogen, which then gets protonated in acidic solution to give this. I'll let you look at that for a while if you wish. At this stage, you may remember, we can convert a nitrile, this carbon triply bonded to nitrogen, into a carboxylic acid by reacting it with acid and water. That gives me this amino acid product. Now I want you to recognize that every one of these synthetic roots to amino acids that I've just shown you do not give you enantiopure amino acids. In fact, because every one of these syntheses uses achiral materials throughout, all the amino acid products will also be expected to be achiral. That is, they will come out the end of the assembly line all completely racemic. Now there are ways to separate the two enantiomers that are discussed in your book, but for lack of time, I'm not going to share those with you today. Now, as I mentioned earlier, individual amino acids form polymers when one amino acid's NH3+, or amine group, displaces the OH of another amino acid's carboxylic acid group to make an amide bond. Let's take a look at that. So if I have three amino acids, and each of these individual amine groups comes in here, electrons go up, electrons go down and kick off the OH after a proton transfer, I get this, and you'll notice that each one of these bonds, the nitrogen bonded to a carbonyl, is an amide bond. These amide bonds in an amino acid polymer are called peptide bonds. A couple more terms here. The free NH3 plus at this end is called the N-terminal amino acid, and this end of this amino acid chain is called the N-terminus. This end over here is called the C-terminal amino acid, and this end over here is called the C-terminus. Where did they come up with that? Well, the N-terminus is called the N-terminus because it has a nitrogen on it, right? So if I've got the amino acid drawn left to right with my free amine dangling off the left, this is the N-terminus. It has the nitrogen on it. The C-terminus is the N has the carboxylate or the carboxylic acid end dangling off of it. So drawn left to right, the carboxylate group is the C-terminal group. So N-terminus, C-terminus. By convention, you guys should know that when amino acids are drawn in literature, they are generally almost always drawn going left to right from the N-terminus being at the left and the C-terminus being at the right. This peptide that we've made from these three amino acids incidentally is called a tripeptide. Now, as we've learned recently, a polymer of two peptides, or sorry, of two amino acids is called a dipeptide. A polymer of three amino acids is called a tripeptide of 3 to 10 amino acids is called an oligopeptide, and of up to 50 amino acids is called a polypeptide. A chain of more than 50 amino acids is called a protein. So proteins really are just made up of one or more large chains of amino acids. Amino acids are the building blocks of proteins. Now peptide bonds, which once again are the amide bonds, in amino acid chains have 40% double bond character. What? What are you talking about, Mike? Well, let me show you. Here's a peptide bond, the amide bond in an amino acid chain. You'll notice that the nitrogen has lone pairs and they donate by resonance into the carbonyl. So these two structures shown are different resonance forms re or resonance structures of this peptide bond. Can you guys see that? Now, Believe it or not, nitrogens, because they're less electronegative than oxygens, 
are more willing to share their electrons. That means that this nitrogen in an amide is thrusting its electrons in here much more prevalently than an oxygen would in a carboxylic acid or an ester. That means that amides do have a certain degree of double bond character between this carbon and this nitrogen. What in the world does that mean? Well, what it means is this. Because this nitrogen-carbon bond has about 40% double bond character, it makes this nitrogen carbon bond somewhat more rigid and less flexible than a regular carbon nitrogen single bond would be. That rigidity gives amino acids their uh, somewhat rigid structures that are eventually conferred into the final proteins that are made up of those amino acid chains. So amino acid chains generally tend to arrange themselves in a way so that we've got the peptide bonds going right down here down the spine and these side chain groups alternate pointing up and down as drawn here. There are certainly some exceptions to this. In fact, many exceptions to this is uh, peptide chains coil and fold to form the protein's final structures. Nevertheless, that double bond character or partial double bond character between the nitrogen and the carbon in this amide certainly confers upon the peptide and ultimately to the protein a certain amount of strength, rigidity, and structure. Now that structure can even be further rigidified when peptides that contain cysteine form disulfide bonds. Now you might have forgotten this already, but cysteine is one of the 20 most common amino acids. It is the, uh, one of the amino acids that has this group here. It has a thiol. In fact, it is the only amino acid that has a thiol. That is an SH dangling off of it. As it turns out, if you have a cysteine somewhere in a peptide, and then somewhere else in the peptide you have another cysteine, those two sulfur atoms can get together, and if they're under mildly oxidizing conditions, they can bond covalently with each other to form this type of compound. This is a sulfur, sulfur bond, which is also called a disulfide bond, or a sulfur or disulfide bridge. The hilarious thing to me about this is that the individual amino acid cysteine is spelled this way with an E. And once you have a cysteine-cysteine dimer, which these two sulfurs have bridged, we now take away the E and call it cysteine with an, uh, just an I. I frankly don't know if I can honestly pronounce these two words differently. I've heard some people say cysteine and cysteine. I don't know, that's just too subtle for me to be able to figure out. Maybe you guys can figure it out, I don't know. <laughs> now believe it or not, these disulfide bonds actually are relevant to our daily lives. You see, over 90% of our hair is composed of proteins called keratins which are rich in disulfide bondage. As it turns out, people with curlier hair have more disulfide bonds in their hair than people with straight hair. So check this out. Let's pretend this is a huge protein. And, and this ribbon here is really kind of a shorthand way of representing a long amino acid chain. Let's say that along this ribbon there are several cysteine amino acids that all have their thiol groups pointing out here. Now if this is under conditions in which these can get together and form those disulfide bridges, you'll see this peptide start to curl and twist. That is the chemical feature that contributes to people having curlier and curlier hair. Now, to illustrate this, I have a picture here of me with my daughter who has supremely curly hair back when she was about three years old. She's much older now, of course, and now she has this gorgeous dark red curly long hair that twists into natural ringlets that are absolutely beautiful. She hates it, but I think it's gorgeous. Now why does she have that kind of hair? Well the reason is because in her hair she has more cysteine amino acids uh, than someone with straight, straighter hair like I have, and those cysteine amino acids in her hair have formed more disulfide bridges than someone with straight. I honestly have to attribute this uh, particular feature of her hair to my wife who happens to have curly hair and not to me. 
Now, in any event, disulfide bridges contribute to the curliness of our hair, and these can be manipulated chemically. In fact, PERM, the magical hairstyling technique that's used to increase hair curliness, actually works by chemically forming disulfide bonds in your hair. The best thing about PERM, of course, is the fact that it smells like a horse's anus. <laughs> I'm just kidding, but if any of you guys know where I can get perm scented uh, air fresheners, please drop me a line. There's nothing more wondrous than coming home to a house that smells like a field of moldering yak carcasses. The sweet smell of perm. <laughs>